students, families, and schools. When it comes to the time for students across America to apply for college, the free application for federal student aid, FAFSA, is a critical tool. For many, FAFSA is the only access to post-secondary education. It opens doors and provides financial assistance to individuals seeking to pursue their academic ambitions regardless of their background. In 2020, the legislators and policymakers sought to make the process even more accessible by passing the FAFSA Simplification Act. With the financial burden of colleges growing each year, it was incredibly important that reform ease the FAFSA process for families. The new law, new law streamlined the long, complex application process. In some cases, students could see the number of questions on the form shrink from eight to 18 from a possible 103 on the previous FAFSA application. However, we've learned over the past three years that the Biden administration's greatest success is its failure at everything it attempts to do. Today, the committee is poised to, for a familiar challenge, oversight. Despite our efforts, the Department of Education's FAFSA rollout was mired in delays and dysfunction. Without accountability, the Department of Education botched implementation threatens, imp implementation threatens to damage students, families, and institutions. First off, the FAFSA simplification has been a federal law since the Biden administration day one. Yet it, it, it did, yet that did not stop the Department of Education from pursuing five months, for punting five months from official launch date of J July 2023 to a soft launch, launch on, on December 2023. It's five months. So the Department of Education did not, did roll out the new FAFSA. Students were met with sporadic glitches, never ending queries, and midriff of technical issues. Some students could not complete the form at all. For those who managed to complete the form, the transmission of key numbers to schools were slow. Without timely data, schools cannot forecast uh, budget, uh, budgets or prepare financial aid packages. Compounding the issue, the Department of Education has made multiple data er errors, rendering hundreds and thousands of records inaccurate and un unusable for schools. Unfortunately, this may only be the tip of the iceberg. New errors are seemingly revealed every week and there may be even a new, a new one by the time this, this hearing is over. These failures are not just impact the taxpayer, who always pay the cost of bureaucratic dysfunction. Institutions could, could be seen as an estimated of 20% drop in enrollment this year. Low-income students who require access to aid are going to be the hardest hit. And these delays don't even account for next year's FAFSA, which will almost certainly be, uh, not be ready by October. This is unfathomable to me that the, the Office of Federal Student Aid received over $2 billion last year. So in essence, the American taxpayer has paid $2 billion to give their children a year or two of chaos and anxiety. FAFSA was created in 19, 20, uh, 1992 with the HEA Reauthorization Act. We've had 32 years of a functioning system that serves hundreds of millions of students and thousands of institutions. Within three years, the Biden administration, uh, Department of Education, has managed to bring the educational industry to a possible game-changing crisis. So what is the Biden's answer to this uh, debacle? He's asking for an additional $625 million to be added to the Office of Federal Student Aid's budget. We're left to conclude that instead of doing the job it was tasked to do, which is helping over 18 million students or potential students apply for FAFSA, this administration opted to waste months of time and energy on a re-election strategy, an un unconstitutional student loan forgiveness scheme. Our conference answers to this, not a dollar more until we figure this out. Students, schools, and, and, and institutions deserve answers. It is our responsibility as Congress to hold the executive branch, branch accountable. I look forward to working together with members on this committee to learn from this botched rollout and to ensure the smooth, clear, and honest FAFSA process moving forward. I yield to the ranking member for her open statement. Thank, <clears throat> thank you so much, Chairman Owens, and thank you to the witnesses for coming today. We know that a college degree is the surest pathway to economic mobility in America. Unfortunately, for many low-income students, particularly those at HBCUs, such as Florida Memorial University in South Florida, where I live, the cost of a college degree remains out of reach. 
without federal student aid. For years, the Pell Grants have helped our want-to-be somebody students achieve the promise of higher education. This is why in 2020, Democrats and Republicans in Congress passed the FAFSA Simplification Act, which aimed to streamline the free application for federal student assistance form and expand student aid eligibility, especially for those who usually would not be able to afford to go to college. Sadly, the holdup with this law raised questions about whether going to college in the fall is even doable for those who can't foot the bill. Students needed their financial aid information months ago to make college decisions, yet many still don't have that information today. I'd like to remind everyone that College Decision Day, which should be a joyous event where students declare where their goal in the fall in May 1st, is May 1st, less than a month away. And we don't want children all dressed up on that day with no place to go. I even have a signing day in my district where the boys and the 5,000 role models of excellence sign just like athletes, but they are signing for academic scholarships. But guess what? Many students won't even have what they need to make that choice. Additionally, this has made things more complicated for colleges and high school counselors as well. They, just like students, have had to quickly adapt to the frequent changes from the Department of Education. These setbacks put decades of progress in jeopardy slamming the brakes on efforts to widen access to higher education and financial stability for students of color, first-generation students, and those from low-income backgrounds. According to the National College Attainment Network, only 32.3% of students from low-income high schools completed the FAFSA form, a 32.9% decrease from the previous year, and only 32.2% of students in high minority high schools have completed the form, a 33.3% decrease from the previous year. This stark reality directly opposes the intended purpose of the Simplification Act, serving as a slap in the face to students wanting to be somebody and achieve the promise of higher education. While I agree that holding the department accountable and investigate its mishandling is crucial, our immediate priority, immediate priority, must be ensuring students and their families have the necessary resources to make informed decisions about their future. We must also ensure that schools and organizations are prepared to assist them. The clock is ticking, and students need answers now. I'd like to uh, request inclusion in the record. The Tampa Bay Times, Tuesday, May 9, 2024, entitled Florida Student Aid Request Plunge, how many will delay or even skip college? And I want to note that there's a graph showing federal student aid applications were lowest among Florida's poorest students. No objection. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Pursuant to Committee Rules 8C, all members who wish to insert written statements into the record may do so by submitting them to the committee clerk electronically in Microsoft Word format by 5 p.m., 14 days after this hearing, which is April 24th, 2024. Without objections, the hearing record will remain open 14 days to allow such statements and materials referenced during the hearing to be submitted to the official uh, hearing record. I'd like now like to turn uh, the time to introduce our four distinguished witnesses. 
Our first witness is Mr. Mark uh, Kentrowitz, uh, who is president of uh, uh, Cerebral, Cerebral, sorry, Cerebral Institute, uh, and, 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 and Cerebral, and, uh, yeah, Cerebral, which is located, sorry about that, located in uh, Skokie, uh, Illinois. Our next, next witness is Justin uh, Drager, who is president and CEO of National Association for the Student Financial Aid Administrators, which is located in Washington, D.C. Third witness is Ms. Kim Cook, who is CEO of National College Attainment Network, located in Washington, D.C. And our final witness is Rachel Fieldman, who is the Vice Provost for uh, Enrollment at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, which is located in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Thank you so much. We thank the, wit uh, we thank the witnesses for being here today and for uh, for forwarding your, your testimony. Pursuant to community rules, I would like to ask each to limit your oral presentation to five minute summary of your written statement. I'd also like to remind the witnesses to be aware of their responsibility to provide accurate information to the subcommittee. Uh, I'd like to start off with uh, recognizing Mr. Kantrowicz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for convening this hearing on FAFSA fail, examining the impact on students, families, and schools and for inviting me to testify before the U.S. House Subcommittee on Higher Education and Workforce Development this morning. My name is Mark Kantrowitz. In 1996, I developed a prototype of an online FAFSA that led to the FAFSA being made available on the web. Since then, I have provided public comments on draft FAFSAs every year. I wrote a best-selling book about the FAFSA. I have served as publisher of several consumer-facing websites about financial aid. My mission is to deliver practical information, advice, and tools to students and their families so they can make smarter, more informed decisions about planning and paying for college. I am pleased to have the opportunity to share my insights with the committee today. The rollout of the 2024-25 FAFSA has been plagued by delays, errors, and communication failures. This has been a frustrating, impossible process for students, families, colleges, and scholarship providers. There have been numerous missed implementation deadlines, long delays, broken promises, clogged call centers, and IT errors. There has been a lack of transparency with the challenges and delays being portrayed in an overly optimistic fashion. The goal of FAFSA simplification was to make it easier for students and their families to file the FAFSA, thereby eliminating it as a barrier to college access and success by low and moderate income students, first generation college students, underrepresented students, and other at-risk students. The launch of the new form has been a disaster in this regard. Let's review how we got here. Congress passed the FAFSA Simplification Act on December 27, 2020, effective for the 2023-24 award year. When the U.S. Department of Education said that they couldn't implement the simplified FAFSA as scheduled, Congress passed the FAFSA Simplification Act Technical Corrections Act on March 15, 2022, to delay implementation until 2024-25. The contract for the simplified FAFSA wasn't awarded until March of 2022, 15 months after passage of the FAFSA Simplification Act. The U.S. Department of Education didn't launch the FAFSA until December 30 of 2023, three months after the usual October 1st start date. The FAFSA was open for only half an hour that day. Problems prevented many students and families from filing the new FAFSA. Fifteen of these problems remain unresolved. When students and families called the Federal Student Aid Information Center for help, they spent hours on hold. Calls and email messages went unanswered. The U.S. Department of Education didn't initially implement inflationary adjustments in the FAFSA's financial aid formulas as required by the FAFSA Simplification Act, despite being told about this problem in May of 2023. They didn't decide to fix the problem until January 2024, after learning that middle-income students would lose an average of about $1,600 in financial aid and high-income students an average of $4,600. On January 30 of 2024, the day colleges were supposed to start receiving process FAFSA data, the U.S. Department of Education announced another unprecedented six-week delay. When FAFSA processing began in mid-March of 2024, applicants weren't able to make corrections yielding high error rates. 
There were also errors that affect about a quarter of all FAFSAs, such as errors in the calculation of dependent student assets and errors in tax data. Applicants will have just a few weeks to make the most momentous decision of their lives. There are 2.8 million fewer FAFSAs filed this year as compared with the same time last year, a 15% drop overall. The drop in college enrollment may be worse than during the pandemic, causing some colleges to close. Several factors contributed to the FAFSA fiasco. Rather than just remove questions to simplify the FAFSA, the U.S. Department of Education decided to change everything everywhere all at once, including an overhaul of the antiquated FAFSA processing infrastructure. At the same time, there was the restart of repayment for federal student loans, proposals for student loan forgiveness, and the new SAVE income-driven repayment plan. There was inadequate testing of the new FAFSA before lunch. Testing was an afterthought, not part of the original development plan. More time, staffing, funding, and testing, and better prioritization of existing staff and funding might have helped. Mr. Chairman, I once again thank you and the committee for taking an interest in the development of the simplified FAFSA and for inviting me to share my thoughts on the matter. I would be happy to answer any questions you may have on this or other topics. Thank you, Mr. Cantorwiz. Appreciate it. Our next, my next witness will be um, um, Mr. Drager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Chairman Owens, Ranking Member Wilson, and distinguished members of the committee. My name is Justin Drager. I represent NASFA, who represents 3,000 college and university and career school financial aid offices, and today I'll be giving their perspective. I want to take us back in time a couple months to January 30th, 2024. That day will live in the collective trauma of most financial aid offices across the country. Um, that was the day that schools were expecting to receive roughly 3 million FAFSA files from the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, to be clear, to the students who had completed the FAFSA up to that point, it was anything but smooth sailing. They had already gone through a form that was uh, only available at certain times of the day and riddled with glitches, to put it mildly. But by January 30th, that was the day the department had told schools that they would start to receive FAFSA files and schools were already months behind at that point. They need those files so they can start to put together financial aid packages, things like Pell Grants and supplemental grants and need-based scholarships and state grants and work study. So you can understand that they were very anxious on this day to get started. At that point in the process, schools had already started sending out early admissions. Schools were, in the coming weeks, going to start sending out regular admissions. By that point, students had already started receiving admissions decisions. What they didn't know and what they still don't know today is how they're going to pay for it. So you'll understand that on January 30th, as they were anxiously waiting at their desks for those FAFSA files, they were aghast when what they instead received was a notice from the Department of Education that FAFSA files would be delayed for another two months. Now, January 30th wasn't the first day of bad news, but it was the straw that broke the camel's back and turned this rollout from a hardship into a crisis. January 30th communication, that communication unfortunately fits a pattern that's been repeated throughout this launch, and it's negatively impacting every school, every student, and every family in your district. And what's that pattern? Well, it's a last minute communication uh, from the Department of Education, throwing schools and students and families into chaos. It's drastic and far-reaching policy decisions, making everyone do 90-degree turns, if not 180-degree directional changes. And it's bad news buried in celebratory publicity. And that's usually stuff that's reserved for press releases, and that's fine. I come from the world of PR and communications. But stuff that's usually in press releases has now made its way into operational releases. Um, and this isn't just a petty list of, of grievances. This really adds up to a crisis of credibility for the Department of Education. Um, and that brings me to today. My, my written testimony lays out with painstaking detail where we are, but I, I want to wrap up with really two points. Overhauling the FAFSA was a big deal. It was a big operational lift. Um, it was necessary and it was important, but maybe the thing I want to highlight most of all, it was congressionally mandated, bipartisanly. And when Congress gives any administration a legislative mandate, it should be the top priority 
of that administration. My second point is we are in an awful place today. Um, schools have all the FAFSA information they need from the Department of Education. But the department estimates that 20% of the files that schools have are riddled with errors. And another 20% of the files on top of that, on average, don't have the numbers that the financial aid offices need to actually calculate any awards. That means 40% of the FAFSA files that schools have are not usable to calculate financial aid offers for students. And that's on average, some schools are higher. And here's the hard truth, and I don't take any pleasure in being here to say this today, but when you have a crisis of credibility, schools don't trust that more errors won't be found tomorrow, that the data that they have today is credible, or that guidance won't change tomorrow. And schools are stuck in paralysis. And not because the department is purposefully mis misleading anyone, but because Ed itself may not know where the next errors are to be found. I'm glad to report the department's reporting more frequently. They're doing more webinars, they're throwing more resources at this, and as of just last night, their communications are more direct. I'm not here to say that all hope is lost. The form is better. I can say it because I've seen it work. I hope that we can salvage this year. I'm looking forward to the conversation that follows this, uh, these testimonies, and thank you for holding this hearing. Thank you, Mr. Stryker. I appreciate that. I will now rec like to recognize Ms. Cook. Chairman Owens, Ranking Member Wilson, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the invitation to speak this morning. NCAN prioritizes FAFSA support and completion because it aligns so strongly with our vision that all students, especially first-generation students, students from underrepresented racial and ethnic backgrounds, and those from low-income backgrounds, have an equitable opportunity to achieve social and economic mobility through higher education. NCAN has long advocated for FAFSA simplification and built a coalition of cross-sector partner organizations to champion it. Completion of the FAFSA is one of the best predictors of whether a high school senior <coughs> will go on to college. Seniors who complete the FAFSA are 84% more likely to immediately enroll in post-secondary education. Our policy goals have been to simplify the form, improve early awareness, and expand Pell Grant eligibility and take up. Encouraging increases in post-secondary enrollment and completion, and lowering errors and verification burden for applicants. The 2019 Future Act and 2020 Future FAFSA Simplification Act brought us comprehensive reform, widely talked about as a simplified FAFSA. According to the Department of Education, 600,000 more students will become eligible for Pell Grants in 2025. We began the school year with high hopes for this better FAFSA. Instead, students and families and the advisors and counselors who support them have experienced FAFSA technical malfunctions, a botched ID account creation system that has many students from mixed status families still unable to contribute parent information to the form, a call center with hour-long waits, drop calls due to volume and incorrect information, and a painfully slow ramp up of applicant data transfers to waiting financial aid offices who now await reprocessing of up to 20% of applicants given formula errors. Open issues remain, including no functionality for upwards of 20% of students who need to make corrections, some resulting from known issues. An unknown number of paper forms still have no test timeline for processing. No data has been shared yet on the status of renewal FAFSA forms. The delayed opening and processing and reprocessing of applications means most high school seniors have yet to receive an aid offer. They are being asked to commit by May 1. Our greatest fear is that they will decide they can't. Students have done all the right things, working hard for 12 years and navigating all the steps in their senior year of high school to continue to college, but they have no idea how or if they can afford those next steps on their post-secondary path. The data portend a catastrophic decline in college enrollment this fall for the high school class of 2024 unless something changes very quickly. About 30% fewer FAFSAs have been submitted through March 22nd than through the same date last year. More than 1 million more FAFSA submissions are needed from high school seniors to match last year's submission rates, which we had hoped to exceed this year. Submission gaps are exacerbated in high, high, in high schools serving large percentages of students from low income communities and in schools with high minority enrollment. NCAN projects that we could reach the June 30 milestone 
with anywhere from 100,000 to 700,000 fewer FAFSA completions this year. These numbers must serve as an early warning sign. The last time we saw such dramatically low numbers was in the height of the pandemic. That notably brought on a crushing 6.8% drop in immediate college enrollment for the class of 2020, with significant decreases for Black, Latino, and Native American students. Post-secondary enrollment still has not fully recovered. It is still possible to inject momentum into this cycle. Despite the challenges, tireless, fierce student advocates and the students and families they support have rolled the proverbial rock up the hill. Despite persistent setbacks, they remain committed to our students and the promise of the better FAFSA. We applaud and appreciate states who, who adopted universal FAFSA completion. We're grateful to the state aid programs and institutions that have delayed their enrollment dates and held back aid for those impacted by reprocessing. NCAN has joined the efforts by quickly standing up and raising an additional $1.3 million in private commitments for a digital media FAFSA completion campaign. The Education Department's FAFSA College support strategy gives needed help to under-resourced institutions, many of whom enroll our students. We urge the Biden administration to allow flexible use of those funds for community-based organizations school districts, and state agencies to continue the work. We also appreciate next week's FAFSA Week of Action, in which the department is raising awareness and holding completion events. We remain committed to working with you for our students. The equity stakes here are monumental, as is the potential impact on post-secondary enrollment. I'd be happy to answer any questions here or an individual follow-up. Thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Cook, appreciate that. Last but not least, I'd like to recognize Ms. Philman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm Rachel Feldman. I'm the Vice Provost of Enrollment at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and also a member of NASPA's FAFSA Simplification Implementation Working Group. That's a handful. At Carolina, we are the nation's oldest and first public university with a mission to educate the leaders of tomorrow from every corner of our state and beyond. We are proud to be both need blind in admissions and meet the full demonstrated financial need of every undergraduate. We provide an excellent education at an affordable price for all. But to do that, we rely not only on the generosity of our state and our donors, but especially on federal student aid. And we cannot fulfill that promise without a working FAFSA. In September 2020, with great optimism, I testified before the Senate Help Committee in favor of FAFSA simplification and excited about the possibilities for the future. Unfortunately, the rollout of better FAFSA has been disappointing. My colleagues and I feel discouraged, frustrated, but most of all worried about the impact this will have on students' ability to attend college and achieve economic and social mobility. Today, I'm going to focus on what it's like on the ground. My colleagues have talked about how rocky the FAFSA launch was when it came three months late. Meanwhile, we at schools were not receiving any data from the submitted forms and struggled to help families and students complete. The near peer advisors in our Carolina College Advising Corps who tried to hold their usual FAFSA completion events for families and students in under-resourced high schools were frustrated and often stymied by federal systems that were down or just not functioning as expected. Today, six months behind our regular schedule, We've received only about 60% of the records we normally would at this time of year. The files we received Friday from the department telling us how many of our files needed reprocessing constituted 48% of the records we can match. And another 20% are rejected because of lack of signature or other known issues. We feel like we're flying blind without a clear path and we have yet to release a single official aid offer despite having re released our admissions decisions. Policy changes are also causing whiplash. More than once, the department's issued guidance only to have it reversed or revised within days. We've done, undone, and redone work more times this year than I can count. Our financial aid professionals and schools feel like the rug keeps getting yanked out from under them. And if they feel like that, imagine how our first generation families and students feel. Also frustrating is how tone deaf some of the com um, communications from the department have been. On March 15th, when most schools had received at most a handful of records, Secretary Cardona wrote a letter to school presidents that in part implied schools were the ones not ready and responsible for the delays in aid offers. At that exact same time, colleagues were reporting hold times of over three hours with the department to try to get help or being put on a priority callback list 
only to wait weeks for a response. And the electronic announcements we were receiving that we rely on for guidance read more like press releases. As one of my colleagues said, enough with the sunshine and rainbows. Higher education is too important to be a political football. I know that each of you are here serving on this committee because you care about our students, their families, and the future. You don't want double talk or sales pitches any more than we do. What we all need is straight talk and timely solutions that get students money to go to college. The continuing delays hurt our most vulnerable students and families the most. Millions of students rely on the support they receive from guidance counselors or outreach programs in order to not just complete the FAFSA but make crucial college decisions. As time marches on, those students are going to graduate and not have those resources. We cannot leave behind talented minds simply because they rely on financial aid to go to college. We in the field are exhausted. We know that there are many dedicated career staff at Ed working long, hard hours who are also trying to fix the issues and they're frustrated, exhausted, and frankly, probably embarrassed at this point. And we're already worrying about next year. Will there be more delays? Will we leave more young people behind? Will I be able to enroll the students that are so key to my mission? We're facing a crisis of enrollment and of trust. But I'll conclude this testimony as I did in 2020 with hope. Once we solve the problems with the FAFSA, I think we're in for a better world. And financial aid being a lifeline for millions of students, we have to make this work. Schools and the outreach community stand ready to do all we can to make things better and help students. We appreciate your help making sure everyone can benefit from the promise of FAFSA simplification. Thank you so much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Ms. Fieldman. Appreciate that. Under committee, com uh, committee Rule 9, we'll now begin questioning witnesses under the five-minute rule. I'll begin the process. The Department's uh, FAFSA delays and errors are not victimless crimes. At the end of the day, students, families, and states and institutions are anxious and frustrated because the departments fail to do the job. Uh, Mr. Gra uh, Drager, in your testimony, uh, you've given several examples of departments sweeping the FAFSA problems under the rug. Why, why did the department continue to downplay the problems with FAFSA over the past three years, even though advocates, groups, and experts were sounding alarm? By the way, this, is, this started back in, as I read your, your comments, back in 2021. So it's now 2024. So we've, we've been sounding this alarm for quite a while. What, what would you say would be the reason for that response? Yeah, I, I wish I knew the answers to some of the reasons why the department swept or, or felt like they couldn't be forthcoming about some of the FAFSA issues. We did start raising them early when they were missing deadlines. Some of those early misses didn't seem like the biggest deal at, at the time because they were just missing a few deadlines or weren't coming out with roadmaps that we expected them to come out with. I think, Mr. Owens, that is a, a completely appropriate question for this committee to be asking of the Department of Education in its oversight function. And not, not really for even political points, but to understand so we don't repeat these mistakes in the future, it's that critical. I can tell you some of the ramifications, though, which is a loss of confidence by uh, institutional financial aid offices. They don't trust necessarily that the data they have is completely accurate, that there won't be more data issues in the future. Paralysis, we just did a poll over the last two days, uh, and we have a good number of institutions who are unsure whether they will be able to go out and send aid offers before May 1, which is the traditional date by which schools ask uh, students to decide where they'll be attending. A lot of schools have already pushed that date back by now. Confusion in the aid office that leads to confusion among students and families, and fear of wrongdoing by auditors and program reviews, that with all of this rapid change in policy guidance, that schools will be left on the hook in trying to backtrack and explain to accreditors, program reviewers, and auditors. And this has ultimately led to this crisis of credibility with the Department of Ed. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kantrowitz, would you like to add to that um, purpose or the results of this, of this crazy out, uh, rollout that we've had? Well, the overly sunny responses by the department weren't really acknowledging the problems that they were experiencing. Uh, they were having, um, it, it was as though this was I mean, to spin a disaster 
as though it was something successful. It was like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. It, it, was, um, it was inconceivable why they wouldn't come out and just say the truth that things were problematic. And even yesterday, they issued an electronic announcement where the 20% of FAFSAs that need to be reprocessed because of IRS data transfer errors, they said that they will start reprocessing them by May 1st. So we have that they're going to start, not when they're going to finish. And by May 1st probably means that they're going to issue it on May 1st or maybe the day before. And so this May 1st National Candidates Reply Date or Decision Day, it can't possibly be on May 1st. And given that it takes colleges at least two weeks to generate financial aid offers, it probably means May 15 is out as well. So I mean, I've been recommending to colleges that they delay until June 1st. And I worry that <coughs> will we have the FAFSA completed, uh, updated by uh, the fall? Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to uh, ask Ms. Philman, uh, what kind of students have been hurt most by this mismanagement of, of the department and who stands to lose the most in this process? Yeah. And clearly, um, students who really need to know whether they can afford school or not, so the lowest income students, are hurt the most. And those that are not accepted to the very tiny number of elite universities that have enough money to make offers without federal aid. I worry most, honestly, about a student in, say, rural North Carolina who's heard all their life that college is out of their reach, they've worked hard for 12 years, but all the voices around them are saying they can't afford it, and we can't get them the document that proves they can, and we lose out on that talent. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much. I'd like to now recognize uh, Ms. Jayapal for her questioning. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Post-secondary education helps millions of low- and middle-income students reach economic success, and millions complete the FAFSA annually to make it possible to pursue higher education, whether it's a college or trade schools. But these are unacceptable issues that we've seen with the redesign and the rollout of processing FAFSA this year, and that's made it very difficult for students to know whether they can afford school. Similarly, colleges have not been able to communicate how much students award uh, packages are, making it harder for students to choose where to go. These issues exacerbate a trend that I see in my home state of Washington, where too many students who may be eligible for financial aid are not even submitting their FAFSA. My state is ranked 47 out of 50 for FAFSA completions. Ms. Cook, the Department of Education must continue to mitigate these FAFSA delays as we've been talking about. At the same time, I believe that Congress needs to examine the barriers that prevent eligible families from receiving student aid. 38% of low-income students receive the Pell Grant, which suggests that some eligible students don't finish their FAFSA. Clearly, this moment with FAFSA is unlike previous years. But what issues have families raised in the past that indicate why they skip applying altogether? Thank you for the question. And if uh, you what, could pull that a little yeah. closer to you, that'd be great. Thank you, Thank you for the question. Uh, what brought us here today are many of the, the issues that you ask about uh, with FAFSA. It was a burdensome form, too complicated, asked many questions that many families had already answered through IRS tax data. Uh, use confusing terms that are not everyday terms, such as IRA, IRA pension rollovers, not unfamiliar to students, um, and really prevented a, a burden and barrier to many students, as you point out. Uh, on top of that, many students experienced a back-end audit-like process called verification that asked students to confirm the information that they had submitted. All of those things brought us to the, better, the simplified FAFSA, the better FAFSA, uh, in the hopes that things like the IRS data transfer will allow students to cl cleanly move over their information that they've already provided to the IRS and taxes for use in income, and that that's verified data that won't be questioned again on the back end. Um, so I hope we are, are meeting a lot of those challenges that we identified in this, in this new format. Yes, we've certainly heard that excessive requirements block eligible students by making the process just altogether too complex to receive aid. And failing to resolve these issues has real consequences, as I think all of our witnesses have laid out. 
including students choosing to skip post-secondary education or those that take on more student debt when they don't need to. That's why I'm proud of my state for taking steps to automatically enroll students in tuition-free opportunities. By using students' eligibility for public assistance programs like SNAP, my state will soon help students realize that they can attend college tuition-free as early as the 10th grade. It's life-changing. What do programs, Ms. Cook again, what do programs like SNAP or WIC have in common that could help eligible students, uh, el eligible families get student aid without a complex application? Well, first, thank you for elevating the issues of food insecurity, which continue to challenge many of our students in accessing college and in, particularly in completing college. Um, Washington was wise to coordinate benefit eligibility to help students gather all of the resources they need to support them in their higher education. Uh, I would also point out that state aid agencies and institutions of higher education now have the ability to reach out to students using FAFSA data to flag potential eligibility so they can coordinate all of those benefits. The FAFSA delays continue to demonstrate the impacts on people's lives when federal programs are just too complex for the average person to navigate. Washington State's automatic eligibility is an innovative way to work around this, and I believe the federal government should continue making it easy for eligible students to receive aid. What do you think, Ms. Cook, we should do to promote early eligibility awareness and minimize barriers to help students receive the assistance that they're eligible for? Early awareness is key to helping students continue the aspirations that many form in elementary school and middle school and continue through high school. I think messaging eligibility, uh, uh, particularly around federal student aid, is key. Uh, we're excited this year that there is a Pell lookup table that allows us to talk to a student in those early years and really demonstrate what the current availability is for aid so that students see this as possible and know that funding is there to support post-secondary. Thank you so much. I yield back. Thank you, and I'd like to recognize my friend from Pennsylvania, uh, Mr. Thompson, Ms. Thompson. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much. Uh, this time of year is typically a ce celebratory one for high school seniors and other students across the country as they gain acceptance letters to post-secondary programs and look ahead with excitement to their future education and, and pathway to careers. Unfortunately, this year, the Biden administration has injected anxiety, frustration, and uncertainty into this process for millions of families across this great nation. While I remain deeply disappointed in the Department of Education and their consistent failure to prepare for what was supposed to be a simplified FAFSA process, we must, we must prevent these issues from happening again and ensure students enrolling for the upcoming academic year have the necessary resources. Uh, Mr. Drager, uh, while we've heard about the issues with students being able to fill out or complete FAFSA due to uh, the department's failure, one thing that struck me in your testimony, written testimony is that we have not heard much about the actual errors in the system is producing, leading to things like incorrect Pell Grant awards. Um, as you pointed out, 20% of students that have somehow been able to fill out the FAFSA have had their applications rejected due to errors that the department says it cannot solve. Now this is in addition to the 20% of applications that the department has already admitted were processed incorrectly. Can you share more about the root uh, cause of these errors and, and what's causing them and what, uh, and what the department could have done to prevent them? Yeah, so just to, to be clear on, these are averages, so you'll see different numbers at different schools and some of these numbers might be higher at individual schools. 20% of the errors are pulling over wrong data elements from the IRS. So those are, are applications that will have to be reprocessed and those reprocessing um, will be on different timelines. So institutions are doing a, a, a bunch of different things here. Some of them are getting aid offers out um, only on the applications that they know are correct. Some schools are waiting for the reprocessing. Some schools are still deciding what they're going to do. Um, and so that depends on every institution. What it ultimately means are delays for students. On top of that 20% are an additional 20% where the form, the applicant data that's going to the school is not generating enough information for them to do anything. They don't have the numbers to calculate a financial aid offer. And that 
is called a, a rejected ICER, and it might be because the student didn't sign the application or the parent didn't sign the application, they didn't sign an authorization to bring over IRS data. It might be because they incorrectly signaled they only wanted loans. Um, there might be a host of reasons. In those instances, the student or the parent needs to go in and make a correction. The functionality to make corrections has not been brought online. Normally, that functionality exists out of the gate, but neither a student or an institution can go in and make a correction as of this morning. So those 40% are basically, as of today at least, dead in the water Very until the, the department takes further action. Well, thank you for that. You actually followed up my follow-up question. You've answered that. Um, and uh, and uh, the frustration uh, the taxpayers are having with the IRS um, could be a contributing factor of the inefficiency of that agency in order to process those uh, tax returns. Um, a lot of frustrations we're hearing from taxpayers right now as well, in addition to students and parents. Um, as, uh, as chairman of the House Agriculture Committee, I also have to express my profound concern for farm families across the country who have not been able to process, prop, to access proper aid as a result of FASFA's formula. Uh, the fact that it counts their assets against them. And those, these are not liquid assets. I don't know what part of a farm they expect them to be able to sell and still be in farming at the end of the day. So farming is an asset-rich, cash-poor industry, and these families should not have their assets, which are necessary to do their jobs and feed our nation, counted against them when determining eligibility for federal financial aid. Um, I think at this point my... Uh, well, I'll try here. Ms. Ms. Feldman, you and your colleagues have encountered, uh, have you encountered any students whose aids have been limited or eliminated because of this new policy? Thank you. Un unfortunately, because of the lack of data or the errors in the FAFSA this year, we haven't been able to do any analysis yet to see how the formula change is impacting our families. Okay. My, my time is about to expire, but I have to just want to say thank you. Uh, my, uh, I was put on my road to my master's degree uh, with semester hours from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Great education and uh, great pig pickings down there as well. So, so thank you very much, I yield. Thank you, I'd like now to uh, recognize ranking member, Ms. Wilson. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> Despite efforts to simplify the FAFSA process, low-income first-generation students and families still are facing challenges. This raises concerns about equitable access to federal financial aid. <clears throat> Ms. Cook, based on N. A. Nakin's FAFSA tracker, what do FAFSA submission rates look like in historically low-income communities right now? Thank you. As I mentioned, about 30% fewer FAFSAs have been submitted this year by high school seniors compared to last year. However, uh, those numbers are exacerbated uh, in low-income communities, which lag seven percentage points behind their better resource peers, and in schools with high minority enrollments, which lag six percentage points behind, and already behind 30%. Can you share some of the specific challenges faced by low-income and first-generation students in completing the form, how do these challenges impact their access to federal financial aid? Sure. Many students are challenged by a lack of knowledge about federal student aid. Uh, the idea that the federal government will provide resources such as Pell Grants and subsidized loans. We work very hard uh, to spread awareness about those. The second piece is around supports. Maybe many under-resourced schools also don't have uh, proper high school counselor ratios to support students or the ability to call on community-based partners to do that. Uh, so there are, there are awareness and support issues for sure. And then previously, the complexity of the form uh, and the, the ability to collect all the information to complete it certainly presented a challenge that we hope this year will turn the tide on. Okay. I'm, I'm very concerned about the potential long-term impacts of the issue on college enrollment, particularly for low-income students and students of color. I've heard many stories where students experiencing issues with the form have lost confidence 
in the financial aid process. And I'm worried that instead of seeking help, these students will instead opt out of college entirely. Are you concerned about enrollment trends as a result of the delays in FAFSA? We absolutely share your concerns. Uh, we've heard from many students that they have admission offers, but no aid offers to communicate that they have an ability to afford and pay for college. How can we address this uh, psychological response to the issue and signal to students that they belong in the higher education system? What can we do? Absolutely. I, the first thing we need to do is get the system back on track and get the aid offers flowing to students so they have the information to make the decisions and to communicate to students that there are ways to afford college, including Pell Grants and subsidized loans and then state and institutional aid. Uh, the second is all of the people, the, the village of people, the school counselors, the access advisors, financial aid personnel, admission personnel, who continue to message to students that they belong and that we can help them make this happen. I'm, I'm extremely concerned, but I do have confidence that things will get better next year. Anytime something is new, anytime you roll out something. So with the Department of Education, I am sure that they're working on these uh, quirks and next year it will be different, but I'm extremely concerned about the class of 2024. Thank you and I yield back. Thank you, and I'd like to recognize Ms. Kaufman. Thank you. Um, my my uh, first answer for me, or first uh, question for Mr. Drager. We obviously are dealing with a mess here today. Thanks for coming over here. Do you feel like the department has owned its mistakes or taken responsibility? And do you believe any employees of the Department of Education, political or otherwise, should lose their jobs because of the botched rollout? The department, um, the department has certainly acknowledged that um, these have been difficult and challenging times. Um, but I have yet to hear any sort of apologies from the Department of Education, and, and not even to schools, but to, to students and families. Um, and maybe I admit that maybe I've missed them, but we are, we are months, six months delayed from where the FAFSA should have been released to students and families. There are a lot of glitches and challenges, and there have been entire swaths of students who have not been able to complete it. So um, we have not seen that. I, I think this committee bipartisanly has the responsibility to explore whether um, there should be ramifications felt as it relates to to those sorts of questions, Mr. Grothman. I would, I would add two points to this. One is, if there was a financial aid director or even a college president that, that delayed financial aid on their campus for up to six months, the, the professional price that would be paid by that, for that would be pretty steep. Um, the second point I would raise is that federal student aid is one of only three performance-based organizations within the federal government. It operates very uniquely in the federal government. That means it's given certain flexibilities that don't exist elsewhere within federal agencies in terms of hiring, HR practices, and contracting. And with those flexibilities should come additional accountability that Congress should hold them to account for. And if it's okay with the committee, we could, we could certainly submit some of NASA's recommendations on, on PBO accountability and, and reform. Okay, we'll switch to Ms. Feldman. Um, when would your university normally send out aid officers? And because of the delays, when will the off offers be sent out this year? Yeah. Normally we attempt to send out aid offers with our offers of admission. So that would have been towards the end of January for our early admission applicants and towards the end of March for our regular. We have yet to be able to send out a single aid offer because of the poor quality of the data and the late receipt of the ICERs. We are hopeful that we have found some workarounds because we are one of those schools that also collect the CSS profile form that will allow us to produce aid offers in a couple of weeks. However, without that, I'm not sure I would have an answer for you today. So you have no idea when, 
when you guess they'll be coming out this year? I, I'm hoping in uh, by the first week of May we'll have something out there. But okay. I'm hoping. Um, I've been contacted by some professionals in Wisconsin. Obviously, we have a lot of colleges there like everybody else. Uh, and they're losing faith in the department. What do you think the Department of Education has to do to restore trust with the colleges and financial aid officers? Yeah, I understand that lack of faith when the information and guidance keeps changing, when just when we think we're going to get information, there's another delay. I think what we really need from the department is for them to own the problems that they have, which they've started doing, and just tell us straight what's going to work, what's not going to work, anything about next year that we should know now. It's, it's sort of hard to believe we're going to all be solved and on time for next year. Let's start planning for that right now, and let's be good partners and try to help each other solve all the problems. Okay, I'll give you guys one more question, which is a little bit off point. You, you can answer it for me. Uh, I, I visited one of my financial aid offices, and to my surprise, uh, they viewed loans as a carrot to get more people in the school. In other words, it's clear they felt you could take out a loan of this size, think how much fun you would have. Uh, do you find any of this attitude anywhere when you get around and... Are you doing what you can to make sure that attitude doesn't get out among you, your, your universities? Well, speaking on the financial aid offices we represent, to the contrary, what we hear from aid directors is they would like the authority to actually limit lending in certain circumstances for swaths of students, something we'd, we'd love to work with you on, Mr. Grothman. Okay, thank you very much. Now, I'd like to recognize Ms. Bonamici for five minutes of questioning. Uh, thank you to the chair and ranking member. Thank you to all the witnesses. I've been on this uh, committee more than a dozen years, and I recall over the years all the co conversations we had about FAFSA simplification. Um, and I don't recall at the time having conversations about the technology part of it and what a massive change. And I think it was you, Mr. Uh, Kaz uh, Travitz, that mentioned COBOL. Um, I, I, I don't recall conversations about what that would look like to completely redo that system technologically, and I've spent a long time working on having the Department of Education work with Treasury to automatically update income payments for income-driven repayment plans, and I kept thinking, why is this taking so long? Why is it so complicated? Because uh, it's something that should be easier than it looks, I think, at, at, at first glance. Um, but the Bipartisan FAFSA Simplification Act it was necessary, it was overdue, and I think there's agreement on that point uh, to help students and their families better access uh, financial aid and affordable higher education. As someone who put myself through community college, college, law school, um, it's been a long time since I filled out a FAFSA form, but I know it was up to, uh, uh, needed to be updated. Uh, and we sit here today with, I think, no question that mistakes were made. Uh, and that communication has lagged. Uh, there's no question about that. And I'm especially concerned about the underserved communities, uh, such as students from uh, mixed status families, students who may be eligible for TRIO or GEAR UP programs. Uh, they've faced additional burdens in completing and submitting their applications. And I know somebody brought up the, the, the lack of assistance from, from uh, high school counselors who are already overburdened with all the other issues that they're dealing with. Uh, and then what happens when school is over uh, and students don't have access to those counselors anymore. I, I, I still have some hope that this application cycle, uh, it, of course, we're, we're going through these challenges now. It's difficult. I hope we can get them solved. And thank you for all the solutions you put out there today. And I hope we can move to a, a really a, a better future for students who are seeking federal aid for post-secondary education with the understanding that the intent of the simplification bill was just that, to simplify not make more complicated FAFSA. Um, Ms. Cook, in February, the Department of Education announced their FAFSA college support strategy uh, designed to provide additional resources to colleges as they go through this process. So how is that college support strategy working? Uh, is, it, is it supporting colleges and universities through the process? And how can the department continue to build on these efforts in the coming months, not just to support colleges and universities, but also students and families? Yeah. Thank you for the question. Uh, we, we were excited to hear about the college support strategy and that it would help support 
uh, the institutions, many of which are under-resourced and many uh, of which enroll our students. Our hope was that those supports would help the, would help the, the schools process ICERs so that our students could receive that all-important aid offer that messaged that they could attend college this year. Uh, many reporters have asked me, well, how will students choose between colleges? And I said, the real question for many of our students, particularly from low-income backgrounds, is if they can afford college, not where. Right. Um, so we hope that those funds are able to support schools that ultimately support our students. Uh, to your question about how we build on that, I think it's increasingly clear that we will need extended time with this, these students, particularly high school seniors in the class of 2024, and we'll need to continue the supports through the summer. Um, in my testimony, I advocated for expanding the strategy to also be able to support community-based organizations, state aid agencies, and school districts right. who will no doubt be called upon to continue to support students Absolutely. past high school graduation dates. And, and you mentioned in your testimony the NCAN um, FAFSA tracker. Yes. So, I mean, this is showing submission rates for current high school uh, seniors and comparing them to historical trends. and. Uh, as, of the, as of the end of March, 35% of high school students have submitted a FAFSA form, which is more than 27% decrease. So how does the FAFSA tracker help states and schools and other stakeholders support fa uh, completion? And, and what can we glean from the current completion levels? That I know the current data concerns you, as you mentioned, and others here at the dais. Yes, uh, the tracker, we hope, we often say in the office that data is a flashlight. So we hope that that FAFSA tracker will help district leaders, superintendents, and high school principals and, and school counselors and access advisors to understand where the outreach is needed the most and how we target, target that to students to encourage FAFSA completion. Well, I, I, think, I hope everyone here today and everyone listening understands that we should be working together. Uh, this is about the students and getting them the answers that they need, and that's what our focus should be. And I, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I'd like to recognize now Mr. Banks, Indiana. Um, Mr. Drager um, and Ms. Feldman, either one of you, uh, Axios Indianapolis reported today that Indiana has seen a 20% drop in FAFSA submissions. That, that means that could mean 20% fewer Hoosiers getting financial aid. What's the best way for Congress to hold the Biden administration accountable for putting uh, people in my state in a situation like that? I mean, it really seems egregious. I think uh, the responsibility, as you've pointed out, does rest with Congress. Uh, as I pointed out earlier, um, FSA is one of three performance-based organizations, and so it does have some additional flexibilities that I think uh, this body bipartisanly should be looking at, including HR, hiring practices, and contracting, and you're off to a good start. You've uh, asked the Government Accountability Office to begin a full investigation of what has gone on with the FAFSA, and I think once that report comes in, it would be good if several of the questions we've already started here were asked directly of the Department of Education. I would agree with my colleague. I think, again, I just want to reiterate, we know there aren't career staff at the Department of Ed for the fame and glory, so there are people there working hard every single day. When something goes wrong, it's the leadership that you look to for accountability, and you can do that through these hearing processes. There doesn't ever seem to be accountability, though. I mean, that's, uh, and I wonder, um, you know, does it, does it appear, either one of you, that the administration is embarrassed by this? I mean, I, it affects so many people. I think um, we have definitely seen an uptick from the administration in putting more resources to this in the last several months, even in the last 24 hours since the this hearing was announced. So many of the things that I put in my written testimony about the issues that have plagued um, the FAFSA rollout from the financial aid office perspective, um, we've seen some changes in, in the last couple months and even in the last 24 hours. But um, so they've, they've thrown more resources at it in terms of showing up at conferences, having more webinars, uh, communicating more frequently. And thankfully, at least and we'll see if this sticks in the last 24 hours, they've been more direct in their operational guidance instead of uh, pumping it up with more f with, with fluff and, and sort of PR. Um, I guess what I would say, though, that a lot of that feels like trying to close the barn doors after the horses have left the stable. And so I think it's going to take additional oversight from bipartisanly from this committee to make sure we have the stick-to-itiveness to make sure that 
that we see it through if we're going to salvage this year. Um, Mr. Kant Kantrowitz, um, the, a new story out this week about the Biden administration make, trying to make another end run around the Supreme Court to erase student loan debt. Is there a connection here? I mean, I, is, there, is there a connection between the botched rollout and erasing student loan debt? Well, I think it's been perhaps a distraction, whereas I mean, the primary purpose of federal student aid is the student financial aid and the FAFSA. Those, those are the bread and butter issues, and where they have been focusing on trying to bypass the Supreme Court ruling through the regulatory process. And I don't know how many of the staff overlap, but it certainly means that they can't have all hands on deck focusing on the FAFSA when some of them are focused on other aspects of the uh, federal student aid's responsibility. So you think it's more of a the distraction means botching a important rollout of FAFSA forms when they should have been focused on the FAFSA forms to begin with? I mean, it's, that's an interesting point. Right. Well, for example, Congress offered to increase their funding if they didn't pursue student loan forgiveness, and they turned that down. Hmm. So at least in that regard, they didn't get the funding they needed um, because they were focused on the student loan forgiveness piece. Yeah, I mean, obviously erasing student loan debt is a political move, a posture leading into an election. Yeah. And you're suggesting that the focus paid there might have very much that 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 focus and those resources should have been focused on doing their job to begin with, which is rolling out these FAFSA forms and helping people like me that relied on student aid to actually be the first in my family to go to college. So shame on them for um, that lack of focus and, and the, the mistakes that they've made. I yield back. I'd like to uh, now recognize Ms. McBeth from Georgia. Thank you so much, Chairman Owens and Ranking Member Tassonier. And thank you to our witnesses for being here with us today. I have read your testimonies. It's obvious that uh, the launch of this year's FAFSA has not gone as we intended, and now it's vital that we do everything in our power to support and provide the flexibility that is so vitally necessary for our institutions and also students to be shielded from any negative impact that this may have had on their daily lives and also operations. The stakes couldn't be higher for many of our college-aged young people across this country. I just spent some time with some early on this morning college students, one of the soror um, sorority groups I was with. So as May quickly approaches, so does uh, College Decision Day. Federal financial aid is a viral part. It's a very, not, well, viral, but also vital um, part of college affordability for many families. And it's heartbreaking reality that some of our students may forego college this year due to the lack of information about financial resources from the delay in the new FAFSA program. Since the launch of this year's delayed FAFSA form, institutions have expressed concerns with their ability to comply with several Title, not, uh, title IV reporting requirements while simultaneously supporting student enrollment and processing financial aid in a timely manner. In response to these concerns, the Department of Education has taken several steps to reduce the burden on financial aid offices and institutions in general. For example, instead of having to provide all required reporting by July 31st of this year, institutions will be able to start reporting financial value transparency and gainful employment data through a new department system starting in July, but will now have until October 1 to submit, giving them an additional two months. I appreciate the steps that have been taken by the department to provide relief to the financial aid teams that are tasked with providing this information as well as processing financial aid. However, one of the many things that has been unfortunately damaged by this implementation has been the level of trust that exists between institutions and the department. And I know that we can and must make a concerted effort to rebuild that trust and to ensure that every student receives their financial aid as quickly as they possibly can. 
and I know that we're working to make sure that nothing like this ever happens again. Um, the plan to collect financial value transparency and gainful employment data through a new system sounds similar to what inst institutions were being told in regard to this year's FAFSA, and I know that they are truly concerned about the department's ability to receive that data as well as when the time comes. So again, I do emphasize how important it is that we fix these issues as quickly as we possibly can and return to the strong level of trust that this department has really, really been known for. So my question is, Mr. Drager, can you please provide context for why these reporting requirements pose unique capacity challenges for institutions this year and how flexibility will help institutions focus on the enrollment and the financial aid process. Yeah, thanks very much. And I just wanna thank you for raising this issue. These reporting requirements will shed a light on outcomes data at institutions in an entirely new way. But it also requires an enormous lift at every institution in coming up with all of the data requirements that will be required to shed light on all of these program by program level outcomes for students. Um, and so for the schools, primarily through their financial aid offices, right now they are six months behind and, and are being asked to do six months of work in six weeks. And so while we appreciate the delay from the department, they only offered a two month delay. And so what we are really seeking from the department is something that's a little more commensurate with the delay in the FAFSA. So if you talk to any institution in your district or any district, we are asking for a, a little bit more of a delay that is commensurate with the delay in the FAFSA processing. Um, at the end of this, I think we'll have something that's valuable for students, but we need just a little bit more time and it will hit hardest the under-resourced schools that are serving the largest numbers of under-resourced uh, students, the students who are most dependent on federal student aid. Thank you so much, and I'm out of time. Appreciate it. I'd like to now recognize Mr. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, we sat here um, many months ago uh, with representatives of the Department of Education, asking them specifically about the FAFSA rollout, rollout about the delays, um, and about their confidence that they would meet all of the deadlines that uh, clearly none of them met. So even the oversight of Congress seems to have no effect on the actual performance of the uh, Department of Education. I find that pretty shocking. Uh, listening to your testimony, there's so many uh, different areas where this seems to have failed. Uh, functionality, the timing, uh, transparency with the Department of Education and their communication. Um, and the accuracy of the back-end processing uh, of the actual results. Uh, I'd like to ask each one of you, what grade would you give the Department of Education in their rollout of simplified, uh, the simplified FAFSA? I would give them an F. F, please, Mr. Drager. F. Yeah, Ms. Cook. C. You don't turn, they didn't turn in their homework and you still give them a C, really? I believe they have turned in their homework on some cases. I am deeply disappointed by the process. Don't get well, me wrong. Well, 40 percent, there's an enormous number of disadvantaged families that would disagree with you today, tonight, as they worry about their child's education future. Uh, Ms. Feldman, do you mind? I guess I'll give them a D for disappointed. <laughs> That's cutting a very fine line there. Um, you know, it's clear that we've identified who has been harmed. I think all of you have very correctly identified that it's really the lowest income. It's the most vulnerable in our society, the most that need and rely on the promise of education to be able to move forward in their lives. And they're the ones that are in the dark, literally, uh, tonight with the, uh, with the decisions uh, about their future. Um, you know, I'd like to skip ahead to what is the consequence and the remedy so I ask another little uh, question here. Could each one of you tell me if you believe that the system will work flawlessly, the simplified FAFSA system will work flawlessly in October? 
uh, of this year, later this year? What's your confidence? Uh, high, medium, low? Uh, medium. We have less than six months before October 1st start date. I'm not certain that they might have to delay that start date. Well, Mr. Drager. Uh, if you're asking me whether the FAFSA will be live and working in October and schools will get that information in exactly. October, Yeah, low. the system would work as designed. Uh, low. Low. Yeah, yeah, Ms. Cook, low. prediction. Medium. Okay. And Ms. Feldman? Yeah, I'd also say low. I think right now I have no confidence that we'll have any records at the beginning of October. You know, I come out of the tech industry, you know, rolling out a um, business process automation or, uh, you know, enterprise uh, scale or web scale type application, hosted application, which is what this is. A lot of back end coordination with, um, you know, IRS or, or other departments, whatever those APIs are uh, that you're making calls from. You know, it's not a, a trivial task to roll this out, um, but this rollout has been disastrous and, you know, frankly, inexcusable. Um, you know, I've heard some of my colleagues today say, we're gonna make sure nothing like this happens again. And I just laugh out loud because our government makes these kinds of promises to deliver these kinds of solutions. We give them billions of dollars to do this and they fail again and again, and there is no accountability. They ignore Congress. They ignore the will of the people. I think 10.8 million families need to shout out their grievance against uh, the Department of Education and their failure to, live, to deliver on the promise of the financial aid. Uh, as uh, my colleagues have pointed out, they spend, kids spend 12 years, parents spend years planning and dreaming and uh, preparing for the opportunities, part of which is uh, particularly with the incredibly high cost of higher education is predicated on exactly these kinds of programs. And our government fails to deliver over and over and over again, and there most certainly will be accountability. Um, for the last few seconds, any suggestions on who we need to have in front of this committee and the questions we need to ask? I think you need to have the operational staff, uh, senior operational days, chief operating officer, before this committee to answer questions about the uh, federal student aid's handling of the FAFSA. Okay, any last comments? I'm over time. All right, thank you, I yield back. Okay. Um, I'd like to now uh, <clears throat> recognize um, Ms. Ledger Fernandez from New Mexico. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you for joining us today. I can't tell you how many texts I've received, uh, which I know everybody on this panel has, uh, from friends, from constituents, just screaming uh, at how difficult it is for them to make a decision. Uh, as I plan to go to graduations uh, now in May, uh, give commencement addresses at graduations, go celebrate, uh, People don't know what they're doing, right? Because they can't make those decisions. And what's really sad is that this is impacting those who most need it. Because FAFSA is for those who uh, need that financial aid. They need to know whether they're gonna get their Pell Grant. They need to get that financial assistance. And so exactly what college is supposed to be about, which is about um, upward mobility, about closing the racial gaps, this uh, disaster of uh, what happened with FAFSA is hurting the communities that I care deeply about. Um, so we know that uh, the delays are causing a drop in enrollment in New Mexico, uh, where applications from high school seniors are down 28% compared to last year. And in New Mexico, we rolled out an opportunity scholarship. So you're gonna have the tuition paid, but PAL grants and the other scholarships and things that come are important because college isn't just about tuition, right? My rural districts, 40%, 40% decrease. Uh, but right now we need to be in the solution game. 
You acknowledge it's a mess, right? We know it's a problem. I don't want to just be in the blame game. I want to be in the solution game. We need to get those applications back up. Ms. Kirk, what are your recommendations for how we can best support students and their families at this time to help them successfully navigate the FAFSA delays? And are there effective community outreach resources we can share with our constituents? Absolutely. Thank you for sounding the alarm on the urgency of the situation. Uh, it is quite urgent. We have limited, precious weeks <coughs> left. I appreciate your solution orientation, and I'm happy to share some of those. Um, this is a very one-on-one -on -one experience to complete a FAFSA in many cases. So the first recommendation and solution is to support school districts and community-based organizations in uh, getting as much time as they can with students as soon as possible to help them complete their FAFSAs while we still have access to them. Uh, during the high school year. Uh, the second is that many states, including New Mexico, which I appreciate, have <coughs> statewide FAFSA completion campaigns. We need to uh, increase and extend those beyond the typical time of March, beyond the typical time of high school graduation. I mentioned earlier that summer supports will be necessary. Um, given the delays, we have a, a delayed opening, but we have a, you know, a finish line that remains fixed that the semester begins in August and September for most students. So we're going to need to use all of the time we have available and make new time that we haven't traditionally made to support students with completion events and individual completion support. Um, again, this idea of using the college uh, strategy funds to support districts, to support funding for summer is important, uh, and encouraging those institutions in your districts to have flexibility on their deadlines for students um, who are still awaiting aid offers and deciding that they can attend. So another issue that I'm concerned about, and I wrote a letter to the Secretary of, uh, signed a letter to the Secretary of Education in February uh, about the problem that FAFSA was having with uh, parents who have mixed immigration status, right? And uh, we wanted to see that fixed. Uh, the Department of Education responded that they fixed this submission error last month, but we know challenges uh, still persist uh, for mixed status families. Could you please share, Ms. Cook, uh, experience you've heard from mixed immigration status families about their ongoing challenges in completing FAFSA, and how are you addressing these concerns? I need to remind everybody that immigrants contributed so much economic vitality to the United States economy, and we need to make sure that we are able to honor uh, that those contributions by ensuring that children who are eligible are make sure that they are able to access the education resources that they deserve. Uh, thank you for that. the The ability of eligible dependent students who have parents without social security numbers to use the FAFSA form was one of the top uh, promising new pieces coming with the FAFSA this year. It also has been the top frustration communicated by our members who serve students, many of whom are eligible dependent students having parents without a social security number. Oh, I, uh, I see that my time okay. has expired. Uh, and uh, Happy to continue in writing. But, but we'd love to uh, have your submissions in, in writing because these are things that uh, people care about in my district and across the country. Thank you very much. And with that, I yield back. Thank you so much. I'd like to now recognize Mr. Good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to our witnesses. Mr. Drager, is there any evidence that FAFSA implementation or successful implementation has been a priority for the Biden administration? Uh, when the Biden administration came in, they asked and met with us about our priorities, and we flagged FAFSA implementation as one of them. Um, and uh, they were receptive to that. But if they took it seriously, uh, I think the evidence speaks for itself in that they didn't take it seriously enough. Over that same period of time, as has been pointed out, they they've have tried to tackle a lot of things, four negotiated rulemakings, debt forgiveness, next generation loans uh, servicing, return to repayment. Um, uh, Operation Fresh Start for defaulted borrowers, and I'm not casting aspersions on what administrations come in and feel they have mandates from, from the electorate. In fact, NASFA has supported several 
of their initiatives. What I would point out is this was the bipartisan mandate from Congress, and the facts speak for themselves of where we are today. Um, if everything is a priority, any CEO will tell you Nothing. you don't have a strategic roadmap then. You don't have a strategic priority. And um, unfortunately, we are where we are today because this did not rise to the, to the top. Yeah, you gave these suggestions to them three years ago, January of 21, which is when the Biden administration started. So they've had the benefit of this for all three years they've been there. And your point, if everything's a priority, nothing's a priority. Well, they haven't made everything a priority. What they've been obsessed with or what they've been focused on, as we know, is the student loan transfer scheme. Uh, this administration has relentlessly focused on what they call student loan forgiveness. And you do wonder, are they just dishonest? Or are they incompetent? Do they really think it's magic money that just disappears when you forgive it and just goes away? And you wonder why they wouldn't do the same with mortgage loans or auto loans or credit cards or what have you, because people don't really like to have to make those payments. And it's not, not really fair that some people have mortgage loans because they bought homes and some people don't have mortgage loans or maybe they paid off their homes. Uh, but in this but in this case, we've delegitimized student loan investment. We've just, just delegitimized the whole process. Uh, but just in the last six months, since October, when FAFSA was supposed to have been done, here's what the administration has prioritized. On October 4, Biden administration announces a transfer of $9 billion in student loan to the taxpayer. November 8, Biden administration announces nearly 5.5 million borrowers are enrolled in the SAVE plan, which allows millions to have a zero monthly payment. December 6, the Biden administration transfers nearly $5 billion of student debt to the taxpayer. January 19, the Biden administration transfers $4.9 billion of student debt to the taxpayers. February 21, the Biden administration transfers $1.2 billion in student loan debt to the taxpayers. March 21, the Biden administration transfers $5.8 billion in student loan debt to the, to the taxpayers. Not to be outdone or not to, uh, to stop uh, pursuing this, just this week, on April 8, the Biden administration announces new plans to transfer student debt, more student loan debt to the American taxpayer. I, I'm su I suppose that is coincidental to the election that's forthcoming. I'm sure it's not a vote-buying scheme. Uh, Ms. Feldman, what student population is most negatively impacted? So what student population most negatively impacted by FAFSA delays? When that's not working the way that it should and there's delays for parents and students, who does that impact the most negatively? Thank you. That, of course, impacts the most the students who need the money to mm -hmm. go to college. And it also impacts the most the students with the least experience with college going. So first generation students, children of immigrants, populations that may have been told all their life that college wasn't for them. They've worked very hard and now they honestly don't know whether they can afford it. So it wouldn't impact as much those families who've maybe had several kids go through college and they've done FAFSA before and they know the process, but those first time ones, uh, in addition to the lower income folks. And does a delayed, poorly executed FAFSA rollout, does that help lower college costs for families? Is, does that do anything to help lower costs? I, unfortunately, I don't think that helps lower costs. It just makes the cost less clear, which is the worst case, right? That, that there's no information to make a decision with. In the bigger, longer-term uh, view of this, uh, does the student loan transfer scheme actually reduce college costs, do you believe? Are, are you asking me if forgiving people's loans at the end Yeah, what does that do overall cost? to college costs more broadly, more generally, if that happens? If we just say, oh, you don't have to pay student loans, then what, do you th what happens to student college costs overall? Yeah, well, I guess for people that don't have to pay their loans, it just got cheaper. Well, it did in the immediacy. But a study from the New York Federal Reserve found that for every $1 increase in loan subsidies, institutions of higher education actually capture $0.60 cents on the dollar through increased tuition. If you delegitimize student loans themselves in the payment process, then more loans are going to be made or taken out, obviously, if you don't have to pay for those, which will ultimately result in more in higher costs being raised. Mr. Chairman, I see I've, lost my, I've expired my time, and I yield back. Uh, thank you. I'd like to recognize Dr. Adams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the ranking member, and thank you all for being here. And uh, uh, certainly, um, we, we want to welcome North Carolina in the House as well. Uh, but let me just um, say that I, I agree with my colleagues that, yeah, that we've got a situation here that right now we need to try to fix it. Um, I've had 40 years on a college campus as a professor and an administrator, and I do understand 
what students need, particularly as it relates to financial aid, as I worked with uh, many students who um, really were first generation, of course they needed that support, and they still do. Uh, so I have a, a, a question, first of all, about the designated entities uh, for, um, for Ms. Cook. Um, you know, we've heard more concerns about um, stakeholders who, and their inability to access uh, student federal tax information to support the enrollment uh, and, and, and the completion. Uh, so we're looking at um, uh, interpretation of both the FOSFA Simplification Act and, and the Future Act, which was a bill that I sponsored. Uh, but um, programs or entities like TRIO and Gear Up and state agencies are unable to access this data. So let me just uh, ask you, um, can you share more information about the, this designated entities issue and, and how it impacts uh, the support um, uh, various educational stakeholders can provide to students? I'd be happy to. Uh, as you point out, these designated entities are the give groups like TRIO, Gear Up, and nonprofits with established relationships with students. Uh, the ability to know the FAFSA completion status on a student level. So that helps me know that Kim has not completed her FAFSA and I should go uh, target her, reach out to her rather than needing to reach out broadly. It allows targeted outreach to support students through to FAFSA completion. Okay. Uh, we had struggled with this for quite some time, the new definitions of federal tax information put into question some ability to share that information. We learned on Friday that designated entities, TRIO gear up and nonprofits with established relationships with students will be able to have access to that data after each state agency updates their SAG agreement with the department. Okay. So are there additional components of this issue that Congress or the Department of Ed uh, need to consider for uh, either this year's uh, phosphorus process or for 2025-26? Yes, so clearly uh, the ability to share this data, which we hope will come in time for this cycle but may come more over the summer or for the coming cycle, will be critical to targeted outreach. Uh, we hear there are still some open questions about the ability to share non-FTI, non-federal tax information across campus, perhaps with other uh, campus supports and to coordinate means-tested benefits eligibility. Right, so we look you. forward to more on that. Thank you very much. Uh, let me um, ask uh, Mr. Uh, Drager, um, can you share some of the ongoing challenges faced by under-resourced institutions, particularly in terms of their ability to support students in navigating the financial aid process? One of the strengths of the U.S. higher education system is we have so many different types of schools that are serving so many different types of students. Under-resourced institutions serve a disproportionate number of Pell-eligible students. Um, working against under-resourced institutions is the fact that they generally have fewer staff, they have fewer resources they're working with, they have fewer systems expertise, and right now in the FAFSA rollout, the Department of Education is asking these schools to do a lot of manual work. They're having to sort through a lot of files manually to determine which files and records are accurate and which ones are not accurate. And that leaves under-resourced institutions at a disadvantage relative to their peers. Okay. Those schools cannot get out aid offers as quickly. All right, let me quickly ask uh, Ms. Feldman. Uh, so if these uh, FOSFA challenges continue, what are some of the long-term impacts on student enrollment, financial aid packaging, and general institutional stability? Yeah, I, I really worry that we will lose the lowest income, high talent students, that they'll choose not to enroll in college and that will be bad for the entire economic and social mobility of our state. Um, I worry that we won't be able to well predict our class and provide the right services to the students who do show up. And the longer we delay, we also delay our connecting of students to campus services like orientation, finding an advisor, summer bridge, and similar programs. So we're not setting those students who do come up for success. Right. Thank you very much, uh, uh, all of you, for your responses. Go back. Thank you. I'd like now to recognize Mr. Moran. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I could actually be a witness today, I think, at one of these hearings because I have two children that are graduating seniors in high school. I am actually going through this FAFSA process like many, many other parents across this nation. 
And so many of us recognize that our students cannot move through that financial aid process until the FAFSA process actually is completed. And in fact, many colleges won't let you move through the in-college scholarship process until the FAFSA process has been completed. I'm going to just tell you a little bit about my experience because I'm looking at my emails right now uh, and I'm going to laugh about some of these emails here in a second because the first email I got was from January the 7th and it says, has my daughter's name, can't be eligible for federal student aid without your input. Help them complete the FAFSA form online. And so for the next month after that, I can tell you, I got online and tried to fill out my portion, which is just to verify my income over and over and over again, several times per week for a month's period of time. And then I finally gave up. And February the 4th, I submitted an inquiry, a case. I got a case number back that day and said, hey, I can't get through because you keep giving me an error message that says it's your fault on your end, effectively, and my daughter needs me to process this so she can actually apply for uh, federal uh, student aid when she goes to college. Got no response. Funny enough, though, except to say, thank you for your inquiry. Here's your case number. Mm -hmm. Two months later, ironically, last week, I get an email that says, We've closed your case. Now, in the interim, it finally worked. After many, many, several uh, weeks of attempts, it finally worked. But then I get an email two months later that says we've closed your case. And also, even more ironically, I have an email from last Thursday that says, Dear Nathaniel, thank you for contacting Federal Student Aid. We'd love to hear your thoughts about your experience. I'm pretty <laughs> sure that they're going to get the, the thoughts on my experience today and through you guys because my experience was not good. And it's not just me, but I know it's millions or hundreds of thousands of other individuals in this country trying to go through the same process and having the same frustrations. And their kids are just looking for an opportunity to get higher education. That's all they want. I'm also hearing from uh, my institutions of higher learning back in East Texas and here's what one of them told me is that one third of the customary FAFSA applications are coming in this year compared to years past at the same point in time, which means less students are actually moving through the process, which means next year we're going to have less students actually enrolled in, in institutions of higher education. This same institution reported that the Department of Education has effectively stopped sending them any FAFSA updates as of March 22, 2024. And they say they have no visibility on their returning students or their new students on who has or who hasn't effectively done that. So they can reach out and contact those students that have applied or that are returning to say, hey, what can we do to help you to try to get them through that process as well? Here was the quote I found really interesting uh, from one of the institutions of higher learning in my district. They said this, the 20... 2024-2025 FAFSA rollout has presented a greater threat to higher education than COVID four years ago. That is their opinion to me because the challenges that their students are facing, they need this financial aid to be able to get out of where they're at in their station in life and pursue their call in this life, and they can't do it because our government has failed them. And I know all of you guys agree with that, and I appreciate your testimony today, but frankly, I want to give you my two cents as a parent that's going through that same process with the same frustrations. Mr. Kantrowitz, I want to ask you this. Based on where things currently stand, how behind is the de de development cycle for the 2025-2026 FAFSA when compared to a typical year? Do you believe there will be additional delays for 2025? Well, in a normal year, typically in February, the Department of Education publishes the draft FAFSA, the, P the paper PDF version, for the upcoming October 1st um, year. Last year, um, for the 24-25 FAFSA, it was a month late. It was uh, March 23rd instead of February 24th the year before. Uh, well, we're past March, and we still don't have a draft of the new FAFSA. So um, we've got six months. Uh, and another concern is that the financial aid formula has annual inflationary adjustments, uh, and through the process of, I mean, they hadn't done the adjustments, I offered to provide them with the tables and documentation to show how I calculated them. I was told that it wasn't as simple as swapping out the numbers. Well, that suggests to me that it wasn't implemented in a modular fashion. So doing that annual update is probably going to be as difficult as it was in previous years, instead of taking this infrastructure redesign as an opportunity to improve the process. So they could still get it done by October 1st, but I've seen no signs that they're working on it, probably because they're still working on 
getting this year's FAFTA 2425 done. So um, I lack confidence that they're not going to have to delay the October 1st date for the 25-26 FAFSA. I, I too lack confidence, I know I'm out of time, but because of these delays and uncertainty, many students who need this financial aid the most are opting not to attend college next year because of the uncertainty of it all, and that is a pure shame. With that, I yield back. Thank you. I'd like to now recognize Mr. Courtney. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you um, to all the witnesses uh, for being here today. Again, your uh, experience on the ground, I think, is just really um, incredibly uh, important right now. And um, I come from a state which, um, looking at the completed FAFSA, uh, we're number one in terms of, in a, you know, but it obviously has been still an incredible um, source of frustration in my district. Um, Mr. Chairman, I have a letter from uh, Mitchell College, which is a small um, Higher education institution in New London, Connecticut, has about 500 students. It's a, a nonprofit college that um, serves a really, um, you know, important population. They uh, have, uh, you know, significant number of students with disabilities that um, are admitted. The uh, percentage of Pell um, students is 61 uh, percent, and 95 uh, percent use student aid. And um, you know, they are doing such great work. The number of applications coming in this year actually went up 40%, but the number of deposits uh, at this point is down 67%, and they really don't have the um, financial strength to, to absorb that. And uh, again, the, um, President Tracy Epsey, you know, obviously, you know, supports the, the intent of this FAFSA reform, but uh, obviously it is really, uh, you know, a crisis almost for that institution. So I'd ask that that be admitted to the record. No objection. So, um, you know, I was around back in 2010 when uh, we passed the post-9-11 GI Bill, which, um, again, was uh, probably one of the most popular, important things that we did in terms of particularly at a time when we had so many uh, people serving overseas. Uh, the rollout, as I think some of you uh, may recall, um, was a complete fiasco. Uh, the VA um, opened up the portal. Um, the system completely crashed. Uh, you know, returning veterans who were uh, about to, you know, matriculate um, still hadn't received their um, subsidy <coughs> from the VA. Uh, I remember uh, the secretary at the time, uh, Eric Shinseki, uh, actually basically had all hands on deck in terms of, you know, manually writing um, checks so that uh, veterans could, could uh, you know, make their payment to, to begin classes. Uh, it didn't do the trick by itself. Uh, it still took really a number of years before um, that program actually sort of was able to finally uh, live up to the mission of serving people who I think every American um, supported in terms of giving them um, a, a much stronger benefit uh, to, under the GI Bill. So, um, Ms. Cook, you talked about, you know, the fact that we've got a week of action coming up, which is, again, that one-on-one -on -one sort of uh, effort. Um, and uh, I, in fact, Mr. Uh, Drager, in your testimony, you described your own personal experience about personally helping students complete the FAFSA as often as I can. It's easier to complete, especially for the most vulnerable student populations. I mean, ideally, if we had the bodies, the boots on the ground to get out there and talk, I mean, it, it, you know, can we make a dent in terms of that approach? And I'll let Ms. Cook go first and let Mr. Drager uh, respond. Yeah, thank you for the question and the urgency that informs that question. Uh, you pointed out that we have a week of action. We need weeks of action. We need days of action. We have a very limited time frame left, particularly with our high school seniors. We're not sure yet how renewal rates are going for current college students, so I would put a pin in potential concern for renewal rates as well. Um, this time really has to be well spent with the students that we still have access to. Some of the Northeast schools you know, go later into the year, maybe through June, where others... Um, are, are ending in May. So urgency to spend time with the students while we have them in school, and again, ringing the bell on the fact that this cycle will, will be extended, and we'll have to look for ways to continue to support and access students through the summer. Mr. Drager. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Courtney, and thank you for raising the institutional voices in your district. You've been a long champion of, of this work. I started in 2010. I remember that rollout, and it's going to take all of us rolling up our sleeves and getting this work done for a sustained period of time Financial aid offices are short-staffed and have been since COVID, but I'm happy to report that they will put in the time. They'll help students complete the FAFSA. I think this year is salvageable. It'll be painful, but we can get through it together. 
And again, I know <clears throat> I've dealt with your membership uh, in Connecticut, and it's just, you know, these are great people who um, really are committed to, you know, helping students, and uh, hopefully that will happen. I, I just want to use my remaining seconds just that, you know, the department, particularly in terms of the public service loan forgiveness program, they were under a court order to fix that program, which had been completely butchered in the prior administration. So, I mean, to some degree, the prioritization is sometimes driven by external forces, which the department really doesn't have under its own control. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. I'd like now to recognize Mrs. Smucker. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to, uh, to our witnesses for being here today. I just recently heard from a constituent who reported that her grandson had been accepted into Penn State University. I, I represent a Pennsylvania district. Uh, in this case, the young man was a star student, varsity basketball player, uh, on student council, volunteers with his church. Uh, should be a happy occasion for him, but he does not know at this point, the family does not know whether he'll be able to attend Penn State University because they will need the financial aid that should be due them. Um, and so this is a difficult uh, a decision for them. They don't know when they'll get those answers. Uh, and so this is an extremely uh, frustrating hearing to me. In fact, perhaps one of the most frustrating hearings that I've been part of. Uh, it, it's not only that student. We've heard from hundreds across the district, certainly thousands, maybe millions. I don't know how many across the, across the country here in a similar, a similar situation. And I've also heard, uh, talk to at least three schools. These are smaller schools in my district. Talk to the presidents of those who literally weren't sure, still may not be sure whether they can open on time because these, they're serving populations that will, that will uh, need that financial aid. So at this point, uh, they should be fairly well locked in on how many students will be attending their school, uh, and they don't know. Um, and, and so uh, this, is, this is affecting not only students, but it's affecting the schools themselves uh, as well. It's a disaster. So I'm... I'm amazed and disappointed that we literally are here. Uh, and it's not a timing issue. This is what's most frustrating. Uh, it, it's not a timing issue. They've had three years to work on this. It doesn't seem to be a money issue. They haven't come and asked for additional resources to uh, roll this out. So it just seems to be a, a, a either just pure bureaucratic incompetence uh, or they just haven't prioritized it. And I know the issue of student loan, uh, you know, whether one, the student loan forgiveness programs, uh, they, they keep constantly trying to go around the Supreme Court thinking up new schemes. Whether that directly affected is, I don't know, probably. Certainly they've paid more attention to that uh, than they have the mandate to fix the, the FAFSA uh, process. And... It, it's, it's almost a pattern now. We've been uh, alarmed by the department's shoddy data testing, their accounting practices. Notably, the department failed two audits in two years. Their independent auditor had to issue a disclaimer that they couldn't trust Ed's basic calculations uh, throughout their budget. Uh, you, uh, Mr. Kankowitz, you mentioned in your testimony that the department initially refused to update its financial aid formulas for inflation, which would have caused millions of students to get less financial aid that was due them. Uh, and they couldn't even do basic testing on, uh, before FAFSA went live to ensure that the information was calculated uh, correctly. <coughs> and as I said, it's affecting students everywhere. You know, I get calls frequently, all the time, to disband the Department of Education altogether. People in my district believe that the federal government shouldn't even have a Department of uh, Education. And boy, this sure doesn't make arguing to keep the Department of Education any easier. Any easier. Um, so maybe, Mr. Kantrowitz, I'll ask you, given their track record, uh, what repercussions do you think this failure will have on public trust in the integrity of its programs and on stewardship, stewardship of taxpayer dollars? Well, the, um, even in a normal year, uh, two million students don't qualify for the Pell Grant because they didn't apply, and they would have qualified, and of them, more than one million would have gotten the maximum Pell Grant. I think we're going to have it be far worse uh, this year, that saves the government some money, but not for the right reason. Uh, and the 
Uh, the challenge is I mean, we're seven months behind. Now, if they had started this process seven months earlier, we wouldn't be in this situation. Uh, and Clearly, and I'm, I'm running out of time, but you know, I'll just ask a question. Can we even make the case that we need a Department of Education any longer? Well, the, the, the problem is, what is the alternative? Would that be any better? Well, maybe we can get someone to run the financial aid program better. I don't know. I mean, we can argue about the amount of financial aid. We can, someone mentioned the impact on college costs. Maybe that's you know, something we should be talking about. But we should never be arguing about effectively administering the aid that, uh, that uh, has been uh, made available. But I, I'm out of time, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I'd like now to recognize Mr. Scott from Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, when we uh, started talking about um, the FAFSA Simplification Act, I was chairman of the committee. Senator Lamar Alexander from Tennessee was chair of the Senate committee. It was a major priority for his. You could simplify the um, form, cut the number of questions by two-thirds, and in simplification, you could increase the number of students eligible and increase the amount of aid they could get. That was the uh, goal, but um, regrettably it hadn't worked out that way uh, so far. No, no one on this committee on either side of the aisle is happy with what's going on. Mr. Drager, you keep talking about there's a six-month delay. Uh, actually, it's a six-month delay after a one-year extension. Uh, so it's worse than what you've been explaining. Um, Ms. Cook, if the program had worked as um, expected, what would the historical, how would the historical complexities of the FAFSA form been addressed, and what would the benefits be for students and family if it had been working as expected? If the form had been working as expected, we would anticipate that we would have increased FAFSA completion rates. Uh, which are important to us because they signal increased enrollment and completion. We would have a faster process where students and their and dependent students with their uh, contributor parents might experience FAFSAs that were record low completion times as low as 10 to 15 minutes rather than 30 minutes to an hour. And most importantly, as we've all talked about equity issues here, we would have expen expanded Pell Grant eligibility uh, to additional students for higher awards. Thank you. Um, Ms. Feldman, you've been dealing with this. Do you have a date by which you expect this to be resolved? We, we have yet to be able to provide aid offers to our students, which we usually do with their admissions. We've tried hard to signal that they need to stick with us, that it's going to be affordable, but it's hard to have them keep trusting us when we just keep telling them they have to wait. Has the department given you a date by which you could have confidence that you'll be getting the information? Just yesterday, they published some dates that indicated that the remainder of the issues with the FAFSAs would be resolved sometime beginning early May. Um, so that's about a month from now. We're hoping that at least for some students, we'll be able to get them aid offers sooner. Now, um, now, if the system actually worked, what information would you get from FAFSA and what would you do with that information? Sure, we would understand the student student aid index that would tell us which of our aid programs they're eligible for. We have a loans free program for students below 200% of the poverty line. We just announced a new program for uh, essentially free tuition for everyone from North Carolina with an income under $80,000. And of course we rely on Pell grants and state grants so we'd also know the amounts of those things so that we were able to show students a complete picture of how affordable our institution could be and hope they would enroll. We'd also know a lot more about what our fall enrollment would be as we've had to extend our deadlines and students are very reasonably waiting until they have a real aid offer in hand to make a decision. Now, if someone is low income, especially eligible for SNAP or Medicaid, why can't you assume maximum Pell and make an offer based on that information? You know, I, I have actually floated a few ideas to our campus of alternative ways we might make offers, but honestly, 
when we give students financial aid, we're using taxpayer money from the state of North Carolina, and I think we just don't want to be in a position where we are risking those taxpayer dollars because we did not estimate correctly, so we haven't moved forward yet with any of those plans. You might find us in that position if the delays continue. And why is partial data not helpful? Well, you know, if you were um, going to court and you had two-thirds of your deposition done, there'd be a third of the information missing. If you were doing your taxes and you only filled out the first three lines with your name, you know, the government wouldn't know what you earned and what you owed. We simply don't have a full picture. And in some cases, we have no information because the match with the government or with the IRS did not work and no student aid index was calculated or sent to us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to now recognize Ms. Hodgson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the witnesses for testifying before us today. I appreciate your time. Uh, I am frustrated, to say the least, that we even need to be having this hearing, uh, seeing how the Biden administration had three years to implement the FAFSA Simplification Act. The updated free application for federal student aid has been anything but simple. I am a parent of two college students, uh, one in college, one yet to be a senior in high school, and we experienced all of the things that have been reported uh, in trying to complete this. Um, Indiana, my home state, is one of 13 states that mandates requirement of the FAFSA uh, for high school graduation. So not only are we adding to the stress of uh, whether or not these students can afford to attend college, in some cases we are literally adding to the stress of their uh, thought process and whether or not they will complete high school. Now, many of these states, including my state, have waivers, but the question would be, do parents, have they been communicated to about the waiver process to decrease their stress levels? <coughs> the Department of Education also <clears throat> unbelievably took a year and a half to even start working on this process and have instead dedicated nearly all of their time to their illegal uh, student loan forgiveness scheme. I've been hearing from school guidance counselors, parents, universities across my state about how far-reaching and disastrous this rollout has been. 18 million students e each year roughly fill out the FAFSA um, and now we're seeing nearly uh, 330,000 applications that have to be reprocessed due to the department pulling the wrong tax data from the form, an inability to make corrections if students have made mistakes. This rollout is par for the course for this Biden administration, and, and it, in my view, is just yet another example of their incompetence. I'm certainly concerned about parents and students not having the answers they need to make these decisions and being left in limbo. Uh, again, I'm one of those parents. But I'm also concerned about our universities experiencing uncertainty around enrollment numbers and smaller fall co cohorts than expected, resulting in their inability to budget and forecast. At this point, there's unfortunately no way to get back the time that's been wasted. We have to consider now how the Department of Education will be held to account and how we can ensure that they will so support students and universities moving forward. Uh, Ms. Feldman and Mr. Drager, uh, have either of you received any form of support or guidance from the department on how to support students who are having difficulties with either submitting or editing their FAFSA? We have received electronic announcements with guidance about when things are expected to be corrected. We've received information about a new concierge email service for schools that are having trouble We've also received requests from the department to help each other, which I will say is a natural instinct of our community anyway. Sometimes I find out a whole bunch of things on social media that are <laughs> happening in the, so, so in that sense, It is a little sense, bit unbelievable yeah. that, you, that you're getting, you know, you do need to get information from social media and not the department. Uh, um, fair, and also, you know, it has been a rich uh, source of memes about financial aid on yeah. social media. So I would say there are ways in which they're providing support. It's just been rapidly changing and revised and sometimes not with the most um, tone of partnership. Thank you. Um, I would say that uh, the Department of Education has put a lot more energy and resource into providing support to institutions, financial aid offices, 
and students in the last several months than it had leading up to when the FAFSA should have launched. And as I've pointed out uh, previously, unfortunately, that's a little bit too late in the process to be coming up with all of these resources. I do think this hearing in Congress is having an impact. Just last night, a new operational piece of guidance that was far more direct than they had been in the weeks previous. So we hope that continues. And as we've also talked about, the college um, support strategy is providing boots on the ground support to financial aid offices. Um, but again, it's coming after all of the, the crisis has, has hit. So we are looking for lessons learned so we can improve this going forward. And I appreciate your personal experience with this and supporting the, the schools of Indiana. Quickly, with the time I have left, um, we've heard from universities calls for guaranteeing last year's aid for students um, that are continuing their education. Is that something that would help? I think that would be a matter of absolute last resort. Okay. So uh, if the department can bring online the functionality that it's promising to be able to do in the next couple of weeks, we will have turned a corner. Right. And we are hoping for that promise. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you. I'd like to recognize the chair of the full committee, Dr. Fox. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank our witnesses for being with us today. Um, it's a very serious issue we're dealing with um, that affects millions of people all across the country. So I want to talk about responsibility, a trait noticeably absent in the Department of Education's FAFSA disaster. Ms. Fellman, is it the responsibility of North Carolina families to ensure the FAFSA is not riddled with technical errors and actually allow students to submit information? Or is it the department's responsibility? That's the responsibility of the Department of Education. Mr. Drager, thank you for being here again. Uh, is it the responsibility of financial aid administrators to ensure FAFSA data is processed promptly and calculated accurately? Or is it the department's responsibility? Department of Education. Thank you. Mr. Kantrowitz, is it the responsibility of Congress to implement a bipartisan law passed over three years ago, or is it the department's responsibility? It's the U.S. Department of Education. Congress passes laws, the administrative and the executive branch implements them. Thank you for clarifying that, not just for the department, but for the American people who often wonder why we are not putting people in jail, okay? Uh, during the Biden administration, the department has certainly been busy. Of course, being busy does not mean being effective, and it certainly does not mean providing benefit for the American people. Mr. Kantrowitz, you've worked in the FAFSA, on the FAFSA for 25 years. Would you describe implementing the FAFSA as one of the more Im most important duties of the Office of Federal Student Aid and its Chief Operating Officer, Richard Cordray? It's a bread and butter issue. This is one of the primary responsibilities of the U.S. Department of Education and the Federal Student Aid, Office of Federal Student Aid. Right. Uh, Ms. Fellman, in your years of institutional experience with financial aid, have you ever seen a worse FAFSA process? Well, sadly, I'm old enough to remember when it was all on paper, so hopefully this will be a little better than that when it's done, but it, the year is nothing but a disaster so far. Do you feel like we're going to have a smooth process in 2025? I hope it will be a lot smoother, but it's hard to know, and I, I don't anticipate right now that it feels likely we'll be ready in October, the usual date. Thank you. Mr. Drager. Instead of implementing the FAFSA, it's now crystal clear that the department spent its time, resources, and staff over these past three years on political projects, some of which are unconstitutional. Do you believe the department's political agenda was more helpful to the American people instead of ensuring 18 million students have a working and timely FAFSA? Uh, I, my hope is that this committee bipartisanly will dig into what were the shortfalls of this implementation. And whatever the department was working on, if it detracted from the FAFSA, we are all now reaping the consequences of those actions. And millions of students are now stuck in limbo, wondering how they're going to pay for college. 
Um, thank you again. Thank you for clarifying that also. You know, this country deserves public leaders who fulfill their duties rather than shirk responsibilities and point the finger of blame at others. I often say that my middle initial A stands for accountability. Now is the time for Secretary Cardona to explain his abysmal leadership to the American people. It is clear something needs to change. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone, for your, your testimony. I'd like to uh, now recognize Mr. Scott for his closing remarks. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, and thank our witnesses for your testimony. Today's testimony underscores the critical need for swift, swift action and accountability regarding FAFSA accessibility, but we also need to get the program on track. The FAFSA Simplification Act was supposed to streamline the process and expand eligibility, but this year's setbacks continue to jeopardize opportunities for countless students. We see this in the alarming decline in FAFSA submissions, particularly among low-income and minority students. And so as many high schoolers rapidly approach graduation day, urgency mounts for clear guidance and support from the Department of Education so that the students and colleges can plan for the upcoming school year. Again, Mr. Chairman, thank you for calling the, this hearing and thank our witnesses for their testimony. Thank you. I just want to say, first of all, thank you so much uh, for your passion, for your understanding of this industry, and for being here to really educate American people to where we are and the threat we now have, really, to our system that, that we've been used to for so long. Also, as I read the, your comments, your, your testimony, each of you mentioned how hard the ground, the, the, those that are rolling up the sleeves, that are actually working 16 hours a day, weekends, to make this happen. So uh, as we walk this process, realize we're talking about the leadership uh, and, and not those that are really trying to, to, to make this thing work out. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of priority, I, I, was, I, was, I read this from one of, the, one of you there, that there was, uh, in 2021, at the very beginning of this, of the Biden administration, there was an appointment to, uh, to Chief Operating Officer for federal student aid, Richard Cudrow. Uh, Mr. Cudrow has absolutely no experience in student aid experience like you guys right here in front of us. What he was, an ex uh, he was a litigator ex uh, ex expert for the, uh, from the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau uh, that used their attempts to, uh, to waive debt. So I think we see from the very beginning where the priorities were, and if you cannot dictate that this is where we should put our energy, then we'll have the kind of results we have right now. Uh, <clears throat> it's time to ask ourselves a big and overdue question. What is the ultimate purpose of the Department of Education? Most Americans think it's to educate, to prepare our children to be the most intelligent and competitive in the world. Over the last three years, leaders in the Department of Education instead have brought pure chaos to students seeking education and to institutions whose mandate is to provide education. Leadership in the department has been distracted, undisciplined, arrogant. And who's paying the price for this failure of leadership? Our most vulnerable, at-risk Americans. The low to moderate income students, the first generation college students, and unrepresented, and underrepresented. Due to the chaos of the last three years, in the upcoming years, there will be broad collateral damage. There will be some vulnerable small colleges across this country who will not be able to absorb the 20 to 30 percent drop in enrollment. Those in this position will shudder. There will be an additional damage to small businesses and towns who depend on the revenue generated by these thriving uh, college campuses. If this is not enough, the Biden administration recently found a bandwidth to issue new rulings to, rulings to threaten the existence of another educational sector, the career and technical institutions. The D.C. bureaucrats are demanding that this institution reduce the length of their curriculum with no consideration of the impact that this have on outcome. If they do not change the curriculum within an arbitrary, uh, an, an arbitrary and impossible timeline, they will not receive federal funding. Those who cannot meet these demands of arbitrary D.C. ruling will face shuttering. Interesting, just like the uh, FAFSA debacle we're now dealing with, with the attack of the Department of Education on the Korean and technical institutions, those that are hurt the most are the low and moderate income students, first generation college students, and underrepresented students, and those are again at risk. Personally, I begin to wonder, based on this remarkable success at failure, 
if the true goal of our education, the Department of Education, is to educate, there's no accountability, no shame, uh, no I'm sorry, we'll get this right next time, and there's no sense of priority. As we now look at where we are today, I am going to convince that there will be 18 million students and families that will remember that they were not the priority of these last two, two or three years. That the priority was to, put, to make sure there was a campaign promise put in place to forgive debt. It's great for the president's future, but it's terrible for our kids' future. And that is not the American way. We've always put our kids first before our needs because we see this vision of a much greater, more perfect union. And I think there's going to be a, a result. There's going to be accountability. I want to say this also. I'm so impressed, number one, by what you have said today, but also everyone who's sitting in, in the ranking member's seat uh, has commented on how much we need to make this work. So we have a bipartisan agreement here. We're going to make this work. Too many of our children uh, are, are not being serviced correctly, and those most vulnerable are being um, hurt the most. So I want to thank everyone again for your comments, for your um, addition to our education. And I would like to thank again, let's see here. I would, and without objections, uh, there being no further business, this subcommittee now stands adjourned. Thank you so much.